Hey everyone, Laszlo Montgomery here. After a world record, longest break in the action ever here in the history of the China History Podcast, I've been busy emptying my nest and uh, sending the last of the Montgomerys off to college. And most of all, I've been tied up writing this speech that I'll be giving September 16th in Shenzhen. Today I'm grabbing the opportunity to get one more CHP episode out before I take that Cathay flight across the Pacific to start my long China trip. Still planning to be in Beijing September 18 to 28, and looking forward to meeting a lot of my listeners out there, all people with good taste. Today we're going to look at a topic that I thought was pretty interesting. It's another in a series of podcasts I hope to do from time to time that covers the history of the Chinese diaspora. I plan to do some episodes on the history of the Chinese in Canada, Singapore, Malaysia, Indonesia, Australia, you know, and elsewhere. But today we focus on Mexico. Estados Unidos Mexicanos, our fine neighbor to the south of us here in the U.S., the story of the Chinese people who came to Mexico in the late 19th and early 20th centuries is often a sad and tragic one. They came to Mexico for all the same reasons Chinese came to California, to flee the chaos of China and to seek economic opportunities in the Americas. More than 60,000 Chinese at one time or another made the trip that took them to Mexico directly from China or via the United States. If you recall from that old CHP 44 episode on the Chinese Exclusion Acts. The whole story really began in January 1848 when gold was discovered in California and the whole gold rush began. Chinese laborers were warmly welcomed to work the mines thanks to their well-earned reputation of being hard workers, willing to work for 30 to 40 percent less than the whites, and for keeping their mouth shut even when they were getting the shaft. 1854, People vs. Hall made it legal in the U.S. to go bash a Chinese and get away with it. This was a sign of the times that were coming, and those Chinese who called California home began to be more vigilant than ever to the threat of potential violence against them. 1862, work began on the building of the transcontinental railroads, and no time at all this led to Heated tensions as white workers who organized a strike for higher wages were stymied by the railroad bosses who began to import Chinese laborers. By 1867, much to the chagrin of the white working man, I imagine, nine out of ten workers in the U.S. building the railroads came from China. 1867, the opportunistic working man's party tapped into this boiling anti-Chinese sentiment and famously adopted as their slogan, the Chinese must go. Anti-Chinese immigration was quite a popular cause as the 1870s rolled around. Even California's own governor, John Bigler, publicly denounced the Chinese and urged his constituents to, quote, check this tide of Asiatic immigration. The Panic of 1873 led to a worldwide depression that put a major damper on the good times everyone was having in the U.S., and particularly in California. Times were tough, and unemployment was rampant. Someone had to be blamed for the suffering of the people. 1877, the Great Railroad Strike led to violence against Chinese in San Francisco. 9% of the population in California was Chinese by then. Anti-Chinese sentiment never ran higher during these economically tough times. They were constantly targeted, and the list of atrocities committed against Chinese, mostly in California and the western U.S., is a long one. The popular sentiment, aided and abetted by politicians who knew a popular cause to wrap their arms around when they saw it, set the stage for the Chinese Exclusion Act of 1882. The Chinese Exclusion Act slammed the door shut on any further Chinese immigration into the USA. The Scott Act of 1888 tightened it a little, as did the Gary Act of 1892. Then, in 1905, after the Chinese had figured out the last remaining loopholes, 
the Supreme Court plugged them all when they ruled in the case of U.S. versus Jew Toy. So, beginning in 1882, the Democrat politicians and the labor unions in the U.S. and whoever else didn't like Chinese immigration all got to take a nice victory lap. The Jew Toy decision had an immediate impact on the numbers of Chinese who now had to consider other options than the USA. And not only did the Exclusion Act and U.S. versus Jew Toy make it impossible to immigrate, it also severely degraded the civil rights of legal Chinese who lived in the U.S. This included Chinese who had been born and raised there. This racist immigration law was kept in force for 61 years until 1943, when it was repealed by the Magnuson Act. So all of this background has everything to do with our topic today. We can zoom way out, and you can see the big picture. Mexico has a long border with the U.S. that runs from San Diego, California to Brownsville, Texas, 3,145 miles in all. If the Great Wall is 5,500 miles long, the Mexico border is almost 60% of that. It's long. The greater part of our story takes place in the Mexican states of Sonora and Baja. These are the states that border California and Arizona. Sonora's largest cities are Hermosillo, Nogales, Magdalena, Abregón, and Gaimas. In Baja State, Mexicali was the main center of Chinese Mexicans. A good part of the story of the Chinese Mexicans takes place there, but also in Mexico City and other places in the South as well. The USA and Mexico don't see eye to eye on a lot of things, but they were sure in lockstep when it came to persecuting the Chinese during the time period of the early 1870s all the way into the 1940s. This was a sad time for Chinese in the U.S. and Mexico. But despite all the sadness, there were plenty of stories of Chinese who persevered and hung in there for the long haul and prospered and who are still around today. There's a Chinatown in Mexicali, La Chinesca. And in Mexico City, there's also a very modest Chinatown, El Barrio Chino, that only runs for a couple of blocks along Dolores Street in the old city center. There's still an Asociación China that keeps the flame lit. This is a chapter of the good old Zhonghua Huiguan, the Chinese Consolidated Benevolent Association. It's still very much alive, and they have a chapter down in Mexicali that does a lot of good works to make sure the Chinese Mexican young'uns have the opportunity to participate in the richness of Chinese culture. Beginning in January 1919, when the 18th Amendment was passed that ushered in prohibition in the U.S., La Chinesca in Mexicali became the Vegas of its day. That's where people in the States would go back in the day to let their hair down. I mean, there was no Vegas yet. Not as we know it. They'd cross the border and, you know, shoot craps at the casinos, get all liquored up and high on opium, and if one was up to it, they could check out the delights of the Mexicali skin trade. La Chinesca had its heyday from 1919 until the 21st Amendment repealed Prohibition in December 1933. I could get in my car right now in Claremont and in three hours if I drive fast. I could be in La Chinesca having a nice cerveza fria, plate of Chinese food, and some steaming hot tortillas. I gotta talk to Rolando about doing that one day. But not in the summer. It was 114 degrees when I was there a few summers ago, and it's 106 in Mexicali as I record this. The whole idea of Chinese people leaving the old country for a place like Mexico began way back in the 1600s when Spanish galleons sailed the high seas. The reputation of the Chinese preceded their arrival. Exports that China had been profiting from since the Han Dynasty, namely silk, porcelain, lacquerware, ivory, and tea, were all well known in the Spanish-speaking world. Trade links had long been established between Spanish and Chinese merchants. The Spanish had their base of trade operations in Manila, where all these Chinese goods were laden on board Spanish galleons that 
sailed east twice a year from Manila to sunny Acapulco in New Spain, as Mexico was called. There, the goods were then distributed to the rich people of Mexico and Latin America, who were the only ones who could afford these Chinese luxury goods. The first Chinese to arrive in Mexico were the servants of any number of Spanish merchants who began to travel these ships since the trade began in 1565. These Chinese accompanied their masters to Mexico. And the Chinese arrived in eh, dribs and drabs and the way it worked for these earliest Chinese in Mexico. After they paid their dues, if they decided to stay, they would keep their eyes open for opportunities in Mexico as you know, tradesmen, a barber, and most commonly as shopkeepers engaged in petty retail at the smallest capillaries of the consumer market. Throughout the entire time that Chinese had been immigrating in numbers to Mexico and the U.S., networks would be built within networks. And as the years passed, these networks of relationships grew more intricate. Like a Ponzi scheme, it was always the ones who arrived first who made the most money. After doing their obligatory eight to ten years of bitter labor, these Chinese would climb up the ladder one rung at a time, and others would follow, and the older ones sponsored the newly arrived ones and helped them rise in society and served as a support network. This theme of Chinese helping Chinese in these faraway lands goes way back. Remember that Deng Xiaoping episode when he did his stint in France? It was the same thing back then, too. In Mexican society in the olden days, when all this was happening, the people were either rich or poor. There was no middle class yet. The Chinese sort of played a role in filling this gap, being industrious and hardworking, but neither rich nor poor. They would sometimes play this middleman role between the two classes. Just like you often see today in America with the Koreans, back in those days when you went to your local grocery or general store anywhere in Baja or Sonora, it was almost always run by a Chinese Mexican. And you could bet your life that the wholesaler who was supplying the small businessman was also a Chinese. The Chinese Mexicans were strong in the mercantile trade all the way up and down the supply chain. And their success was a source of a lot of red eyes in their communities. The Chinese always lived apart. No Mexican wanted them near them, and the Chinese were probably just fine with that. So that was the way it was. The Chinese had always referred to the Philippines as Luzon, which are the characters for Luzon. Mexico was referred to as Ta Luzon, Big Luzon, and the Philippines, if they weren't called it yet, began to be referred to as Xiao Lu Song, or Little Luzon. So these earliest Chinese who found their way to Mexico and planted roots mostly came with the Spanish galleon trade that ended in 1815 with the Mexican Revolution. Spain really had a great run for four centuries. More Chinese continued to come to Mexico. Many came who already knew someone there. Most didn't know anyone and came simply as recruited labor, rolling the dice and hoping for a better chance in life than what could be expected in China. But the lion's share who came in the late 19th and early 20th century came to Mexico because, frankly, the door to the U.S. was closed and almost airtight. After the Chinese Exclusion Act of 1882 and the anti-Chinese legislation that followed, if you were Chinese and felt compelled to get into the U.S., you had to land in Mexico first and use that as your gateway into that place where the streets were paved with gold. If you remember past China History podcasts, the last decades of the Qing Dynasty were bad times in China. The impetus to get up and leave China came from the civil unrest caused by, among other things, the Taiping Rebellion, famines, overpopulation, and just one miserable year after another in China. And during the final years of the Qing Dynasty, the country degraded into warlordism, and there was a breakdown in central authority. And we all know from watching the news today what happens when that happens. China was having a rough time, and for some, these were desperate times that required desperate measures. 
And these brave souls, even though the very thought of it was repugnant to them, picked up and left China and tried their luck elsewhere. Those years, the 1850s, 60s, 70s, and into the 20th century, saw a massive Chinese diaspora. From 1848 to 1888, over 2 million Chinese emigrated to Taiwan, Vietnam, Burma, California, Hawaii, Australia, Canada, the West Indies, Philippines, Indonesia, and Malaysia. The next wave of Chinese who came later continued on to Cuba, Peru, and Brazil. By 1900, a good 5 million Chinese had spread out around the world. By 1922, this number would reach 8 million. And of those 8 million Chinese, practically every one of them came from either Guangdong, Fujian, Macau, or Hong Kong. 335,000 Chinese made their way to the U.S. between 1848 and 1882, and most of those ended up in California. In 1852 alone, 20,000 Chinese entered the U.S. in San Francisco. Starting in 1867 with the construction of the Central Pacific Railroad, 40,000 laborers from Guangdong would make the Trans-Pacific Voyage over the next few years. By 1877, 148,000 Chinese called the U.S. home, or at least a home away from home. And of that number, if you had to guess where they came from, it was probably one of ten cities in Guangdong, the biggest four being Taishan, Xinhui, Kaiping, and Unping. First the gold rush, and then the railroads. A one-two punch. Then, once those numbers reached critical mass, the Chinese became a market unto themselves. That's when things really began to take off and get organized. And whenever you needed to get your hands on 70 Chinese laborers for your particular project, you inevitably had to go to someone within the Chinese community who served as your channel to the labor supply in the Middle Kingdom. But once 1882 rolled around, if you called yourself Chinese, the golden door in the U.S. was locked shut. And if you remember, slavery had been abolished pretty much everywhere by the 1850s and 60s. America was a little late to the party. So without the economic advantages of slavery, and with the whole industrial revolution thing chugging at full blast, there exploded onto the scene a massive worldwide market for cheap labor. There was a double demand for Chinese labor, not only for working as a, a cog in the wheel of Western imperialism, but also as agricultural workers and miners in the boom towns in California, Hawaii, British Columbia, and Latin America. And pretty much from the get-go, wherever they went, the Chinese were preyed upon by racists, bigots, and all manners of sinophobes. If they didn't resent the Chinese for their industry and achievement or for depressing workers' wages, then they disliked them simply because they were different. And this difference in appearance and culture was always the racist last resort. So with all hope of legally entering the U.S. down the drain, Mexico became the place to go to. But it wasn't just a place to go to so that you could use it as a transit point to cross the border. Mexico during this time the 1870s and into the 80s, really was a land of opportunity. A hard-working guy from Guangdong could do a lot worse than Mexico in the late 19th century. That was the one thing that really made it happen more than anything else. When the door closed in the United States, it opened up in Mexico. The president of Mexico was a man named Porfirio Diaz. He was the kind of leader who wasn't what you'd call a liberal, but... He championed all kinds of economic reforms that enriched the country, especially those at the highest rung of society, and sponsored all kinds of attempts at modernization. He just didn't like the dissenters to get in the way, so he was a little heavy-handed in that respect. But he'll get his as the Mexican Revolution starts to ramp up. One of the programs of the Diaz government called for European settlers to be imported who would serve a dual purpose. First, they would provide the necessary labor to work the lands in the barren and sparsely populated northern part of Mexico, and as an ulterior motive, 
the white skin of these imported Europeans would, in theory, lighten the overall skin color up in those parts. And these Europeans would also bring with them, you know, all their reputation for hard work, as well as some of the new innovations. It was a good plan, but it didn't work. The summer months of northern Mexico can be uncomfortably hot. The Sonoran Desert was, and still is, a brutally unforgiving place. So guess what? The Europeans didn't like the place, and that whole notion of bringing them into northern Mexico was scrapped. But the labor shortage remained, and this opened the door for the Chinese. In 1865, Emperor Maximilian was the leader at the time during this brief period of monarchy in Mexico. In that year, he granted a certain company, the Compañía de Colonización Asiática, the exclusive rights to import laborers into Mexico. These Chinese laborers came at first to work in agriculture and mining as well as public works. The period of Maximilian's rule in Mexico was short-lived, only lasting a few years from 1864 to 1867. Republican forces led by President Benito Juarez put an end to this short period of monarchy and had the emperor executed. But the Emperor Maximilian got the ball rolling, and by 1880, things began to shift into a higher gear, thanks to a man by the name of Matias Romero, who, in his capacity as Mexico's finance minister, facilitated the mass importation of Chinese labor into the country. Romero had written, quote, It seems to me that the only colonists who could establish themselves or work on our coasts are Asian coming from climates similar to ours, primarily China. The great population of that vast empire, the fact that many of them are agriculturalists, the relatively low wages they earn, and the proximity of our coast to Asia, means that Chinese immigration would be the easiest and most convenient for both our coasts. And as an extra added benefit to all this, Romero knew that this importation of labor and the dealings with the Chinese would help cement better trade relations between Mexico and China. Even though there weren't any official diplomatic relations between these two countries, the scheme really took off in the 1880s, dovetailing nicely with the new restrictions that came as a result of the American-Chinese Exclusion Act in 1882. Romero had to go to Washington, D.C. to speak with the Chinese minister there to arrange for the importation of labor into Mexico. In 1884, an agency was set up in Hong Kong that would serve as the exporter of all this Chinese labor. And someone with good connections to the Mexican government, no doubt, was given the exclusive rights to transport all these workers from all ports in Asia. This was the Mexican Pacific Navigation Company. Between 1885 And 1889, Matias Romero worked tirelessly via the Mexican embassy in the U.S. to work out a commercial treaty between Mexico and China. The only problem was, again, if you consider the time period, China was in shambles. And anyone who would be responsible for such a decision had more important things to do than discuss trade with Mexico. So Romero, due to the lack of a negotiating partner, found the going very rough trying to work out a deal with the dying Qing government. But as his luck would have it, in 1891, Chinese diplomats did finally reach out to Romero. And over the period of the next eight years, with the help of Vice President Ramon Corral, they worked out a deal. And this became known as the Treaty of Amity and Commerce. And it was this treaty that opened the floodgates of Chinese immigration into Mexico. And as far as the government of Mexico is concerned, this was going to resolve the labor shortage problem once and for all. The way things worked, you didn't just sign a treaty and stick an ad in the classifieds. The Mexicans needed a conduit to source the laborers in China, handle all the paperwork and financing, and get them into the country. To do this, they called on the ones who were the most expert when it came to that business, the leaders of the Tongs, who ran San Francisco's Chinatown. It was these Tongs, known as the Six Companies, and their agents in Hong Kong and China, that served as the first 
authorized contractors of Chinese labor to Mexico. It was the six companies, or six tongs, that acted as the chief sponsors of the illegal smuggling of Chinese immigrants as well. The whole system was created whereby agents would find these workers and get them transported across the Pacific to agents waiting on the other side in the U.S. and in Mexico. And these agents would distribute all this muscle to whoever needed it. And everyone got rich off the trafficking and human labor, except the worker, of course. Not only were Chinese workers brought into toil in Mexico, after 1882, intricate schemes were put in place that brought the laborers to Mexico, where they would later be smuggled across the border into the U.S. And the most popular U.S. destinations back then were, of course, San Francisco, but also Tucson, San Diego, El Paso, New York, Boston, and New Orleans. In 1895, there were only 1,023 Chinese in all of Mexico. By 1910, this number had grown to over 13,000. And by 1926, this number almost doubled to 24,218. Now, in the Chinese context, this might not seem like such a big number. Between 1895 and 1910, when the biggest wave of Chinese immigration occurred in Mexico, 70% of the immigrants had come to Mexico via the U.S. And of that 70%, most of them worked in the north in Baja, Sonora, Chihuahua states. Whenever you talk about the Chinese population, it's easy to think in terms of superlatives. But at 24,000 strong, the Chinese back then constituted Mexico's second largest immigrant community. Though clustered mostly in the northern states of Mexico, by 1910, Chinese immigration had permeated every single state in the country, except for Tlaxcala. But the USA remained the highest priority destination for the Chinese. So with Mexico's convenient geographic location, all kinds of ways were devised to scam the system to get around the Chinese exclusion laws. So it's interesting to note that the first illegal aliens to be sneaking across the border into the USA and running from La Migra were not the native Mexicans and Latin Americans. It was the Chinese. This system of smuggling Chinese across the border into the U.S. via Mexico would later hit the skids temporarily with the outbreak of World War I due to the interruption of Trans-Pacific shipping. So the informal Worldwide Association of Chinese, led by the six companies or Tongs in San Francisco, directed this entire flow of legitimate and illegitimate human cargo to the labor markets of the U.S., Canada, Mexico, and Cuba. These tongs didn't just engage in human trafficking. The majority of their business was legit and involved trade in goods as well. Cuba had become a major hub for Chinese looking for a way into the U.S. The sugar plantations of Cuba just couldn't get enough of this Chinese labor. Between 1847 and 1874, over 125,000 Chinese made their way to Cuba to work the plantations as contract laborers. With the abolition of slavery in Cuba in the 1870s and 80s, there was an unquenchable thirst for contract laborers to cut sugarcane all day long. Cuba sort of mirrored Mexico in a way in that all these contract Chinese workers would work their way up from coolidom to small-time merchant, and with the Cuban economy growing like it was, they thrived and prospered. And of course, word got out about the comparative riches that could be earned by Chinese in Cuba, so that led to many more signing up to sail to the Americas to try their luck. By 1922, there were 90,000 Chinese in Cuba, more than in the U.S. The six companies had a man in Cuba named Chin Panoy. He was the agent there and served as the point man to move much of this Chinese labor. He worked with the Tongs to devise and carry out schemes to smuggle Chinese from Cuba into Mexico and to the U.S. Up until San Francisco took over as the main center for the smuggling trade, Havana had been the place. Havana had served the same role in the Spanish galleon trade that Manila had served. Manila was the hub of all galleon trade between Spain and East Asia. Havana was the hub between Spain and Latin America. 
But Chinese immigration to Cuba didn't start until 1847. This whole operation of trading in Chinese laborers that stretched from the streets of China to Havana, Cuba, was all run on Guanxi. The Chinese had developed a network of Guanxi around the world, as it is in many cultures when you developed certain bonds amongst your trusted people, anything was possible. Certain men situated in certain cities around the world with their reputations alone to back up whatever they said they would do, moved Chinese labor all over the place. Not everyone looked at Mexico as a launching pad into the U.S. Many came there as their final destination to live there after they had paid their dues, working as ranch hands, launderers, cooks, servants, and gardeners. During the 1880s and into the 20th century, Mexico, Cuba, and South America always had an unquenchable thirst for Chinese workers on the vast number of ranches and plantations. But all good things must come to an end, and in Mexico... Things took a major turn for the worse for the Chinese as soon as nationalism began to take off. The system of importation of Chinese labor, championed by Mateo Romero, had done well during the time of Porfirio Diaz, but nationalism was on the rise and was used by some Mexican politicians to further their specific agendas. The Revolución Mexicana began in 1910, and this spelled the end for Diaz, who had been in power since the death of Benito Juarez in 1872. Diaz would be overthrown in 1911, which was a happy day for the little guy who had been totally left out of most of the Porfiriato era. This was not a good thing for the Chinese Mexicans, or Fronterizos, as they became known, those Chinese who lived in the northern frontier regions of Mexico. One of the things that always seemed to go hand in hand with nationalism was xenophobia. Mexico was definitely raped and pillaged for many years by European interests, I guess going back to the time of Cortes. So there was quite a big pent-up backlash against these foreigners in Mexico, and the Chinese got swept up into all this. You see, they came as coolies first, but with their work ethic and having faced the worst of times in China already, Mexico was really a land of great opportunity where if you took that Chinese work ethic there, you could really make something. And this is what they did. And although no Li Ka Shings were created from this dynamic, many Chinese would inevitably open up small businesses and prosper in a modest way. But modest as it may have been, it was much better than what the native Mexicans normally enjoyed. So a lot of eyes got real red from this relative Chinese success. And so the Chinese, as the Revolution began to unfold, got caught up in a violent wave of anti-Chinese feeling. They had seemed immune from all the events that had been slowly leading up to the Mexican Revolution, but 1917 saw policies that began to restrict immigration. So not only were the doors closed in the USA, now they were closing in Mexico too. The racial slurs began to fly and the politicians spoke to ears more than willing to hear what they already felt, that the Chinese were a race of contaminators, unhygienic, vice-ridden, and claims were made that the Chinese spread disease and contributed highly to the degeneration of the Mexican race. And in these revolutionary times, they had been accused of faithfully supporting all of the policies for all of these years of Porfirio Diaz that had called for liberal immigration laws, foreign investment, and involvement in plundering Mexico's wealth. This is what led to the uprisings that resulted in the Mexican Revolution and the growth of what became known later as the Partido Revolucionario Institucional, or PRI for short. The current president of Mexico, Enrique Piña Nieto, and just about every president since the revolution, except for Vicente Fox, was a member of this party. So after 1917, 
Voices began to call for the expulsion of Chinese from Mexico in general and from Sonora State in particular. In these times that stressed patriotism, nationalism, and xenophobia, the call went out to the people to Mexicanize themselves, the country, and the economy. And nowhere was this sentiment stronger than in the North. All these years, the native Mexicans had to watch as the Chinese climbed the economic ladder, leaving them behind, and even worse, marrying their women. Now came the chance to blow off a little of that pent-up steam. The anti-Chinese propaganda in Mexico during the Revolution and into the 1920s and 30s was pretty much the same as what you found in the U.S. during the 1870s and 80s. The idea of Chinese men marrying local Mexican women was considered particularly repugnant. And for their actions, these women will be particularly singled out by their countrymen as traitors. They'll be booted out of Mexico along with their husbands. A particular kind of scorn was placed on these Mexican women who married Chinese men. Adjectives used to describe them were words like dirty, lazy, unpatriotic, and shameless. It was a popular saying that these women were lazy and lived off their rich Chinese husbands to avoid having to do any honest work. There are plenty of cartoon sketches and whatnot from back then that can attest to this. One such cartoon had the caption, quote, O oh, wretched woman, you thought you would enjoy a cheap life by giving yourself to a Chinese man, and instead you are a slave, and the fruit of your mistake is a freak of nature. Pretty heavy stuff. Ironically, when the Mexican wives got kicked out of Mexico with their husbands, they usually made their way back to the husband's village in China, and many of them found they were relegated to Arnai, or second wife status, as their husbands already had a wife and whole other family in the home country. But overall, when you peel the onion all the way to the center, the Mexican people who lived amongst the Chinese in these towns located in the three states of Baja, Sonora, and Chihuahua, well, and other places too, they mostly resented the Chinese hard-earned economic success. And when Mexico's economy began to take a turn for the worse at the same time when the population was rising, this produced a deadly mixture of animosity that led to all kinds of atrocities being committed against the Chinese. By the 1920s, there were laws put in place that reserved jobs for Mexicans only. The 20s were especially harsh for the Chinese in Mexico. Associations began to spring up that led the charge against immigration and for their expulsion from Mexico. But most notorious of them was the Commercial Association of Businessmen in Magdalena de Quino. This was led by the man who became the champion of the anti-Chinese movement, Jose Maria Arana. Arana became the face of the anti-Chinistas who took a page out of the playbook written up in California about how best to persecute the Chinese. Between 1911 and 1919, as many as 814 Chinese were killed. They were killed by both soldiers and civilians, and looting Chinese groceries and stores became a regular occurrence. They were looted by soldiers and then by the locals who would jump into the fray. It was just like you see in today's society when riots occur. The association's purpose was to defend the Mexican merchants and to rid Sonora of Chinese business owners. Others followed as the 20s unfolded. There was the Comité Directivo de Antichinismo Nacional and La Liga Nacional Obrera Antichina. I'm sure you don't need to hablas espanol to know what the nature of those organizations were. These groups lobbied hard to get their politicians to pass anti-Chinese legislation, segregation, deportation, and laws against intermarriage. Sonoran authorities have been calling for the end of Chinese immigration since 1921 and for the end of the Treaty of Amity and Commerce that had launched the massive wave of Chinese into Mexico. The Chinese consulate closed in 1922. Hundreds of Chinese met grisly deaths in northern Mexico during the years of the Mexican Revolution and into the 20s and 30s. On May 15, 
1911, 303 Chinese had been murdered in a single day at the massacre of Torreon. This was the signature event that came to symbolize the anti-Chinese violence that later led to all these mass deportations. Torreon is located in the state of Coahuila, right on the border with Durango. With the permission of their superior officers, revolutionary soldiers let loose on the Chinese of Torreon between May 13th and 15th, 1911. On the last day of the massacre, May 15th, 303 Chinese and five Japanese were murdered. The looting and downright robberies that were carried out led to losses of $850,000. That was $1911, a vast figure in that day. This Toreon massacre was the single greatest act of violence committed against Chinese anywhere in the Americas. A wave of anti-Chinese sentiment preceded the massacre. Things just didn't happen spontaneously. Resentment had been building up for a while against the Chinese community of Torreon. There were perhaps only six, seven hundred Chinese in the city, so you could see about half the population was murdered in a single act of violence. The city had been held by the Federal Army, but they were about to be shooed away by the revolutionary soldiers who were called Maderistas after the man who helped overthrow Porfirio Diaz, Francisco Madero, later the 33rd president of Mexico. Once the Maderistas took over in Torreon, the bloodbath ensued. Let me quote one report taken from Robert Chao Romero's book, The Chinese in Mexico, 1882-1940. Let me quote... The town was searched for Chinese, and all who could be found were murdered in the most brutal and horrifying manner. In one instance, the head of a Chinaman was severed from his body and thrown from the window into the street. In another instance, a soldier took a little boy by the heels and battered his brains out against a lamppost. In another instance, a Chinaman was pulled to pieces in the street by horses hitched to his arms and legs. No language can adequately depict the revolting scenes which attended this carnival of human slaughter. The mind recoils in horror from the contemplation of such an atrocity. Everything regarding the massacre was well documented in a report made on June 7, 1911, called, quote, The Report of Investigation of the Chinese Massacre. It was made by the U.S. Consular Agent C.C. C. Carruthers, like you had when atrocities were meted out against European Jews by the Nazis, there were also plenty of local Mexicans and good Samaritans who risked their lives to hide as many Chinese as they could and spare them from the killing. Not only were Chinese killed and their places of business robbed and looted, private Chinese homes in Torreon were also broken into, set on fire, and completely ransacked. Justice was sought, and in 1913, an indemnity was agreed upon between the government of Mexico and China, whereby the Mexican government agreed to pay 3.2 million U.S. dollars for the loss of China's subjects in their country. Nothing was ever handed over, though. It was only a symbolic victory. Rivalries, politics, and factions in China and in Chinatown in the 1920s began to divide the overseas Chinese. Fighting and violence often erupted between these Chinese factions, and this became known as the Tong Wars of 1922-1924. The rivalry between the Kuomintang and Qi Kong Tong spilled into Mexico, and the violence and infighting that climaxed in 1927 was conveniently used as a further reason to push for this movimiento anti-Chino that called for deporting not only the troublemakers, but any other Chinese Mexican they could snag in the net. The slow stream of deportations turned into a flood, so that by the 1930s, 70% of the Chinese in Mexico had been deported or expelled. The deportations were mostly in the north, in Sonora and Sinaloa. On August 8, 1922, over 300 Chinese were sent back to China by order of no less a personage than El Presidente Alvaro Obregón himself. 
but all over Mexico, Chinese weren't safe and faced not only getting kicked out of the country, but having all their assets confiscated too. You see, there's an old trick that goes back to ancient times. Whenever you wanted to make some quick and easy money, all you had to do was kick out the foreigner and, you know, using intimidation and violence, you force them out before they have any chance to put their affairs in order. Then, as soon as you see the last of them, you could jump in and help yourself to their house, their business, and any other property and assets the victims left behind in their hurry to flee for their lives. The Jews faced this in Nazi Germany, and so did the Chinese in 1930s Mexico. Two governors in particular played a major hand in the deportation of Chinese from Mexico, Francisco S. Elias and his successor, Rudolfo Elias Calles. But for the Chinese, it was particularly difficult. When they were deported from Sonora, many of them were led to the border with Arizona and then just dumped on the other side. With the Chinese Exclusion Act still in full force, the U.S. immigration authorities in Arizona wouldn't let these Chinese in and just threw them all in these immigration jails where they'd linger indefinitely. Many died from the abuse they faced living in this world of political and legal limbo. The Mexican authorities did a splendid job in ridding the nation of Chinese. In 1937, President Lazaro Cárdenas expropriated all lands owned by foreigners, including from the Chinese. And this act chased a lot of them out of Mexico. By the time of a 1940 census, there were found to be only 92 Chinese in all of Sonora. And that's in the state of Sinaloa. The population of Chinese had gone from 2,123 to 165. The same kind of thing was going on in Baja and Chihuahua State, all in the north of Mexico. But it was in Sonora, where the Chinese were most plentiful, that they got it the worst. In fact, in all of Mexico's 31 states and the federal district of Ciudad Mexico, Chinese felt the hammer come down hard on them. In the 1920s, the Chinese Mexicans of Mexico City were forced to go live in ghettos, but the violence that was so horrible in the north didn't get as much traction down in the south. Because of the Chinese Exclusion Act, most of the Chinese ended up getting deported back to China, to Guangdong, Macau, and Hong Kong. Macau, with its Portuguese heritage and tolerance for mixed marriages, was the preferred place to go to after arriving back in Asia. And after arriving in Chinese lands, many of these Chinese Mexicans fought for years for the right of return. This fight lasted from the 30s all the way into the 60s. There were people inside Mexico who fought on behalf of the Chinese to allow them to return. And slowly, as attitudes changed and laws changed with the attitudes, things began to loosen up. The first ones allowed back were the Mexican-born wives of these Chinese deportees. Their husbands followed later as the rise in anti-communism sort of began to heat up in Mexico. With this kind of anti-communist sentiment, Coming to the aid of these Chinese was seen as a good thing, since in most cases they were anti-communist too. After World War II, there were many Chinese-Mexican repatriates who slowly made their way back to Mexico. There were a lot of hoops they had to jump through in the process, but with the help of the Mexican government in the 50s and 60s, many made the long trip back to Mexico that was very much changed from the time they left in the late 20s and early 30s. Today, in Mexico City, there are about 9,000 Chinese. In all of Mexico, about 14,000 overseas Chinese currently reside there. And there are perhaps 40,000 Mexicans of Chinese origin. And like I said, the main centers where Chinese reside are in the capital, Mexico City, Mexicali, Tijuana, and also in the state of Chiapas. To prepare for this episode, I relied on three main sources. The Chinese in Mexico, 1882 to 1940, by Robert Chow Romero, published by the University of Arizona Press, Making the Chinese Mexican, Global Migration, Localism, and Exclusion in the U.S.-Mexico Borderlands, by Grace Pina Delgado, published by Stanford University Press, and Chinese Mexicans, Trans-Pacific Migration and the Search for a Homeland, 1910 to 1960, 
by Julia Maria Chavone Camacho, published by the University of North Carolina Press. This wasn't a history that yielded up any big names that you might see in the history books. The stories contained in these three books are all of brave, unknown Chinese who made the dangerous journey across the Pacific, ended up in Mexico because of the way events were unfolding in the Americas, and made a life for themselves. There were so many success stories and stories of incredible bravery and acts of love in the face of the most terrible hardships. I didn't get into any of these specific stories, but if you're interested to read up more on the subject, there's plenty of detail about many of the individual stories and those three books I've named. This is going to be the last podcast before my upcoming trip to China. I'll be on the road from September 14 to the 29th, going to be in Shenzhen and Beijing. I might try and upload an episode when I'm out there, but we'll see. Hey, I stumbled on some great videos by a guy named Howie Southworth. Go on the Google and search for Howie Southworth, just like it sounds, and it'll take you to his uh, YouTube and Evox television channels. He's another good example of someone who is using his love of China to build some nice bridges between the two cultures. Howie's specialty is bridging the gulf between American and Chinese cooking. The show is called Sauced in Translation, and he also has one called How We Eat, H-O-W-I-E, Eat. I personally recommend them. Hey, a huge thanks goes out to the people at Donway.com, Jeremy Goldcorn, and the whole crew there. Thanks for selecting me as a model worker for 2013. That's quite an honor. I look forward to thanking everyone there personally when I get to Beijing. That's all I got for you this time. This is Laszlo Montgomery signing off from the town of Claremont, California, 91711. Thanks for listening. Adios. And I hope you'll join me next time for another, dare I presume, exciting episode of the China History Podcast.